did the British abolish the slave trade? My name's Krista Petley. I'm Professor of Atlantic History at the University of Southampton. And I'd like to talk to you about that question. Now, on the face of it, it might seem like a fairly straightforward question to answer. The slave trade, of course, was an atrocity. So ending it might seem to us to be the obvious thing to do. But thought about historically, actually this is quite a tricky question for us as historians to make sense of. Slavery, and with it slave trading, had been part and parcel of the experience of empire for centuries, even millennia, before the British decided to end the slave trade in 1807. We're interested, incidentally, in that moment, ending the slave trade, not the abolition of slavery itself, emancipation, which comes later on. So to think about that question, I'd like to use some evidence that survives from these debates. And I'd like to use that evidence to complicate the picture that we've got of the debate about the slave trade, which is very, very often presented to us as one of morality against economy. So, for instance, we're probably fairly familiar with the idea of abolitionists as being um, morally motivated, selfless, altruistic. Men like William Wilberforce um, personify this movement and being up against the uh, venal, self-interested uh, economic lobby of slave traders and slaveholders. Now, as this talk will show you, there's much to be said for that characterisation of the debate, but it's also a debate that's much more complicated than that. So to do that, I want you to think a bit about some evidence. And in doing that, we'll be thinking about what it is that we as historians do. How do we work as historians? And of course, central to the practice of history is doing research with evidence, using that evidence to put together a convincing analysis of any given historical period, topic or question like this one. Those are really important skills, not just for doing history, but they're transferable to all sorts of different contexts. And I would suggest actually that being able to do this sort of thing well, making evidence-based decisions is essential, not just to history, and to a whole variety of different workplaces, but to society much more generally. So let's do some of that work and let's think about this then in relation to our central question. And a good point to begin is to think about what it was that the opponents of the slave trade were up against. So we need to think then about the slave trade. What we know about it is that over the, the period of the slave trade, um, between, the, uh, between the period of, say, 15, the 1520s and the 1860s, we know that about 12.5 million, at least that figure, um, at least that number of enslaved Africans were forced across the Atlantic to labour in the New World. More than one in four of those captive Africans left on a vessel headed for part of the British Empire, going to the sorts of property that you can see illustrated in the slide in front of you, a sugar plantation, and the major destination for enslaved people within the British Empire, within the British Caribbean, was the colony of Jamaica. So this picture is of Antigua, but it's fairly typical of sugar plantations elsewhere in the region, although it's something of a sanitised image, as so many of these things are. The slave trade is extremely deadly. Many enslaved people, in fact, died before they reached the African coast. Many died before the vessel arrived to transport them across to the New World. We know that on the notorious Middle Passage between Africa and the New World, about one in every six enslaved people forced aboard a slave ship died, didn't make it across the Atlantic. And even then, the first few months for any enslaved person within the Americas 
were extremely dangerous and many more died in that particular period. Those who survived did this kind of work, working on a sugar plantation to uh, raise sugar that was of course transported back to Europe uh, for, for sale. And that process helped to transform the consumption habits of people back in Europe. So um, in England, for example, we have people who are consuming this in so many different ways. Cakes, tarts, scones, sweet tea, sweet coffee, hot chocolate, you name it. The, the, the ways in which um, the, the, the sugar trade transformed the, the diet of, uh, of English and British people in the 18th century were really quite far reaching. Also, though, of course, this trade made fortunes for those people who had invested in it. Um, so the owners of sugar plantations, like the Taylor family pictured here, but also those who invested in the slave trade, often stood to make a considerable amount of money. They were also quite well politically connected, a very powerful lobby group. So that's something, then, of what the abolitionists were up against when they started to criticise the British slave system at the end of the 18th century. But one thing that's really important to bear in mind is that these men and women were not just up against a cruel and lucrative slave system. They were not just up against wealthy and well-connected men. They were also up against a set of ideas. And so the source that you can see in front of you here expresses some of those ideas that were presented by the, uh, the, the, the slaveholders, by the plantation owners. What you have here are the ideas of a planter called Edward Long, a British author who owned sugar plantations on the island of Jamaica. And here you can see that Long is making the case that enslaved children, women and men were merely a commodity. The law, he argues here, represents and treats those people as though they are merchandise. So he describes them as, in his view, and he's making this case for his readers, that enslaved people are fit objects of purchase and sale, transferable like any other goods. And he says that this is common sense. This has long been the practice. It has been um, supported by Parliament through legislation. He describes it here as the national sense. This is something that is a long-standing practice and accepted practice. So abolitionists are working against that. And this is why that is so revolutionary. What you can see in front of you there is the famous logo and slogan of the British abolition movement. The kneeling slave with the slogan, am I not a man and a brother? It was distributed around the country by Josiah Wedgwood, who was a member of a committee that came together in 1787 to begin a campaign against the slave trade. And what I would like you to do is to have a look at this image and have a think about it. Why is it that something like this might appear so revolutionary? How is it that this challenges those ideas that you saw on the previous slide expressed by the slaveholder, Edward Long? Another thing we could think about is why it happens at this point. Why is it 1787, not 1687 or 1887. Now that's a really important question to think about. It's not something we've got time to go into here. And so for now we should concentrate on this particular image. Versions of this design circulated all around Britain. It, it appears on pottery, it appears on jewellery, in anti-slavery publications. It becomes part of a nationwide campaign. It was a mass popular campaign and one of the first and most influential examples of pressure group politics. Here were people 
with a really strong sense of moral purpose, coming together with this strong image and um, set of ideas, determined to turn all of that into legislation and, um, uh, and to make uh, a substantial change. And this is a really, really important episode, a defining episode in British history. It's necessary also to think about how this image and the slogan have their limits. The idea of enslaved people being men and brothers is uh, one that comes from a really strongly held Christian view that all people are made in God's image. Abolitionists, as you can see from what you've got in front of you, wanted to evoke sympathy for slaves. That's what this is designed to trigger in you, the viewer. Look at the figure, kneeling, without much in terms of clothing, chained. It's designed to provoke sympathy. It's de designed also, you could argue, to provoke a sense of pity. This person is asking you for your help. The implication here is that here is somebody who cannot help themselves and so needs to beg for help from others. What could be more different to that than this? Here is Toussaint Louverture, one of the leaders of the Haitian Revolution, on horseback, bearing a sword. Toussaint Louverture was a former slave who led an uprising against Fran French plantation owners in the French colony of Saint-Domingue which was a huge and productive sugar colony near to Jamaica in the Caribbean. Now, the events that L'Overture was uh, swept up in became known subsequently as the Haitian Revolution. This is a huge uprising of slaves against the French slaveholders of the colony. It begins in 1791 and went on for more than a decade as armies of former slaves, self-emancipated people, fought against armies sent from Europe to try to crush their rebellion. Finally, in 1804, French Saint-Domingue, now fully under the control of former slaves, became an independent nation with the name, of course, of Haiti. Now, the story of the Haitian Revolution is relevant to our analysis of British abolition for one simple reason. It demonstrated to people at the time that enslaved people did not have to beg for help in order to free themselves. They were perfectly capable of taking up arms against their oppressors. You can see Louverture doing that here in this image and freeing themselves. Now, for many, that was a deeply terrifying proposition. Here you've got some of the really luridly offensive and grotesque propaganda of the pro-slavery lobby put together. Uh, we presume, we don't know very much about who actually produced this image, but it reflects the kinds of ideas that are being expressed by slaveholders and slave traders in the era of the Haitian Revolution. They argued that the Haitian Revolution was a sign of how dangerous it was to interfere with the slave system of the Atlantic world. Slaveholders argued that enslaved people, that black people, Africans, were uh, violent and bestial, and that they were best kept under the control of slavery. They argued that abolitionists, by proposing reforms, would simply inspire revolts and uprisings in the Caribbean that would end in bloodshed and in anarchy. So all of those kinds of ideas are put together by the opponents of abolitionists and they're extremely successful. These arguments based on prejudice and fear help to stall abolition 
throughout the 1790s. They put the brakes on and mean that abolition does not come before Parliament and, uh, and get um, decided until the early 19th century. Eventually, though, the Haitian Revolution helped the British abolitionist cause. And the reason for that is that the prospect of slaves taking up arms against their oppressors was not only terrifying to slaveholders. It was also terrifying to people like this man. Here is Prime Minister William Grenville, the Whig politician who, during his short time as Prime Minister, introduced the Abolition Bill to Parliament from his seat in the House of Lords and then shepherded it through to become law. So it's Grenville who introduces the 1807 Abolition Bill to Parliament. Now, I told you a few moments ago that what we would do is to look at evidence to try to answer our question of why did the British abolish the slave trade? And it seems to me that the most important piece of evidence that we should look at is the way that Grenville introduced the Abolition Bill to Parliament. Let's have a look at Grenville's speech. So why was Grenville proposing to abolish the slave trade? Well, here he says that he appears before the Lords, appears before Parliament at the call of justice. He's saying that he's standing up because he's motivated by a sense of justice, morality, we could say. And he's trying to address what he describes as the greatest injustice that has been committed by which the annals of mankind can possibly be disgraced. So he wants to abolish something that he sees as a, a, a historically unjust uh, phenomenon, the slave trade. So morality clearly has something to do with it for Grenville. But that's not the only basis on which he introduces this legislation to the House of Lords. Grenville knew that it wasn't possible to convince the hard-nosed politicians in the House of Lords, many of whom were slaveholders themselves, with a simple plea to morality. He also appears to have believed very strongly himself that the abolition of the slave trade was necessary because it served the national interest. So how did he think that abolition served the national interest? Or as he expresses it in the language of the time, was um, justifiable on the grounds of policy. The short answer to that is Haiti. There are a number of things that Grenville talks about in this speech as practical reasons for the abolition of the slave trade, but one of the most prominent is the example of the Haitian Revolution. What had happened to French Saint-Domingue? And here, what Grenville was doing was drawing on some of the recent arguments that abolitionists had made. You saw that they began their campaign with the Am I Not a Man and a Brother slogan with a strong appeal to British sympathy. But their campaign became more sophisticated and wide-ranging by the early 19th century, and they'd begun to add practical as well as moral arguments to their case. They reasoned that ending the transatlantic trade in slaves from Africa would not damage the colonies, as the slaveholders claimed, nor would it bring about an immediate end to slavery. What they claimed was that ending the slave trade would trigger useful reforms. Put simply, what the abolitionists proposed was that by ending the slave trade, slaveholders would be forced to improve conditions on the sugar estates. They would no longer be able to rely on the trade in enslaved Africans in order to replenish their workforce. So that would mean that they would have to treat their workforce a little bit better in order to make sure that enslaved people reproduced and that their workforce 
was at least maintained or grew by that kind of natural reproduction, by births outnumbering deaths. That was what the abolitionists thought would, um, would allow for a reform of slavery, for slavery to become more humane uh, and also more self-sustaining. They also argued that this would help to prevent uprisings. The argument went that if enslaved people were better treated, they would be more content and less likely to rise up. And Grenville believed these arguments. You can see him here making the comparison with Saint-Domingue, with Saint-Domingo. He says, continue the importation of enslaved people from Africa and you will add fresh fuel to the flames which will consume the islands. In other words, the slave trade will provoke slave uprisings. Remove it and you have a more stable and sustainable slave economy and society in the Caribbean. So, essentially Grenville was worried about this question. Could a man like Toussaint Louverture have emerged in Jamaica or another of the British colonies and led enslaved people there to freedom and independence? Grenville was worried that the answer to that question might be yes. And he was convinced that one of the ways to avoid that in the British colonies was through reform, through these kinds of ideas that he expresses here in his speech, introducing the Abolition Act to Parliament, an act that he argues is justifiable on the grounds of policy, the national interest, in order to head off revolution. It's worth noting that the Abolition Act failed in those aims of improving conditions for enslaved people on the plantations and as a counter-revolutionary measure that would prevent slave uprisings. In the years after 1807, conditions on the plantations continued to be extremely arduous for enslaved people and in most parts of the British Caribbean, births did not come to outnumber deaths and there were lots of, of uprisings, including uh, a rebellion in Jamaica in 1831 that helped to set in motion the debates in Parliament in the 1830s that led to emancipation. That's to say the ending of slavery itself, not just the slave trade. But the 1807 Act, the abolition of the slave trade, is nonetheless really important. And I think we've gone some way at least to unpacking the kinds of arguments and the sorts of reasoning that abolitionists and also sympathetic politicians like William Grenville, the Prime Minister, the sorts of ideas that they put forward in order to justify an end to the slave trade in 1807. We see that abolitionists and sympathetic politicians like Prime Minister William Grenville were indeed motivated by ideas of morality. The idea that all people are made in God's image, that it is wrong to treat enslaved people as property and trade them across the Atlantic as such, that the slave trade is a great injustice. All of those things come through, not just in the evidence of the abolition campaign that we've seen, but also the Prime Minister's speech introducing the 1807 Abolition Act. But we also see that there's more to it than just that. The abolitionists are interested in helping enslaved people, but they see enslaved people as people requiring their help, their intervention. The way that they present their campaign is not helping slaves to help themselves, but in order to lead enslaved people towards a better future. And we see in the Prime Minister's speech that he is concerned with the national interest. He sees the abolition of the slave trade as something that was a counter-revolutionary measure, something that would help to provide better economic and social stability in the British Caribbean, to help the slave system in that part of the empire to operate and not succumb to the sorts of uprisings that we see in the French Caribbean 
and therefore for the British to hold on to their empire in the Caribbean, to keep hold of those slave-run sugar colonies that are still extremely valuable. Ultimately then, what I think that we see is a faith in top-down reform and a fear of revolution from below. So those are some thoughts using evidence about how we can complicate the answer that we might give to the question of why did the British abolish the slave trade? Thank you very much for listening. I've added here some um, suggestions as to where you could go if you want to find out more. Some of the things that I've been talking about um, come from the book that I finished fairly recently on Jamaica and the Age of Revolution, which talks about the rise of the abolition movement and all of these debates surrounding the 1807 Abolition Act that we've discussed today. You can also have a look at this, uh, this longer reading list, which is presented to you here in no particular order, um, of a whole range of different things that you could look at, read and explore to find out more about the topics that we've discussed today.